Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for this webinar on the government's proposed changes to university funding. My name is Stephanie Hadabas. I'm a student at the ANU and an ambassador for the ANU learning communities. In a moment, I'll introduce our host and panelists. But first, I'll just provide a bit of information about ANU learning communities for those of you who haven't come across us before. We're a student-led organisation that brings people together to explore areas of common interest. In our events, we engage with cross-disciplinary communities to facilitate learning outside of the classroom. We are an inclusive and open to everyone. You don't have to be studying at the ANU to come along. So for more information, you can sign up for our newsletter or check out our Facebook page. Um, Okay, so this evening we'll be discussing the implications of the proposed changes to university funding. And we have five great speakers who've agreed to share their thoughts and get involved in the discussion. Our first speaker will be the Honourable Dr. Andrew Lee, Shadow Minister for the Treasury, for Treasury and Charities and Federal Member for FENA in the ACT. Prior to being elected in 2010, Andrew was a professor of economics at the Australian National University. He holds a PhD in public policy from Harvard, having graduated from the University of Sydney with first class honours in arts and law. Andrew is a fellow of the Australian Academy for Social Sciences and a past recipient of the Young Economist Award, a prize given every two years by the Economic Society of Australia to the best economist under 40. Um, I will just mention that Andrew can only stay until half past six today, but there will be a chance to ask questions before he logs off. Our next speaker is Dr. Gemma King. Dr. King is a senior lecturer in French studies at the ANU and the author of Decentering France, Multilingualism and Power in Contemporary French Cinema, published in 2017, as well as Jacques Audiard, uh, which is forthcoming. Researching in the humanities discipline of film studies and teaching in the priority area of language, uh, her role reveals the multidisciplinary nature of the contemporary university and problematizes the division of university funding according to the proposed new rules. Next, we have Dr. Josh Brown. Dr. Brown is a lecturer and convener of Italian studies at the ANU. He has a broad research interests and has recently investigated the use of the word crisis in reference to humanities. Next is Emeritus Professor Bruce Chapman. Professor Chapman is an economist with extensive experience in public policy, including the motivation and design of the Higher Education Contribution Scheme, or HEX, engagement with the empirical and conceptual basis related to long-term unemployment leading to the Working Nation Program in 1994. He also worked as a senior economic advisor to Prime Minister Paul Keating, as a higher education finance <laughs> consultant to the World Bank and various national governments, as a consultant to the Bradley Review of, Australia, of Australian Higher Education on Student Income Support, and as a consultant to the Australian Government's Base Funding Review in 2011. Next, we have Professor Andrew Norton. Andrew Norton is Professor in the Practice of Higher Education Policy at the ANU Centre for Social Research and Methods. And he was previously the Higher Education Program Director at the Grattan Institute. In 2013 to 14, he was the co-author of a government commissioned review of the demand-driven student funding system. And in 2016 to 17, served on an expert panel advising the education minister on higher education reform. And finally, our host for the evening is Professor John Hewson, former leader of the federal opposition Professor Hewson has had several careers in academia, bureaucracy, business, politics, and the media. He is currently a professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU, 
and an adjunct professor at Curtin, UTS, Canberra and Griffith Universities, having been a professor and head of the School of Economics at UNSW and professor of management and Dean Macquarie Graduate School of Management at Macquarie University. He has worked for the Australian Treasury, the IMF, the Reserve Bank, the UN and the ADB and often advises senior public servants. So now I'll hand over to Professor Hewson and our speakers who will each outline their ideas, followed by a brief panel discussion and then a Q&A discussion where you can ask any questions that you may have via the chat function here on Zoom. Okay, thank you. Um, over to you, John Hewson. Thanks very much, Stephanie, uh, for that uh, very nice uh, long introduction to most of us. Uh, look, this is a very important subject. And unfortunately, the background is, I guess, that successive governments over many years have made a lot of ad hoc changes to university funding, some quite significant, as the HEC scheme was, and Bruce will talk about that, I'm sure, but a lot of ad hocery. And right now, of course, with COVID, the university's funding has been hit pretty hard by a couple of things. One, the fall off in foreign students, and also the restriction on using the so-called education funding to fund research. So research itself has suffered enormously now uh, on the background of a lot of other cuts as well. Also working against the background of the Prime Minister's own personal prejudice against higher education. Uh, he. Um, he thinks universities have become fat and ugly in university in, in administration terms. Um, vice chancellors pay themselves too much money in his view. And they're a hotbed for breeding left-wing radicals who may end up being critical of the university. So the bottom line is it's very difficult to get much sense out of him in what is a very difficult time for the university sector. Uh, and the sector is a major employer, of course, and a major exporter, as well as, of course, our enormous standing internationally as a, as a university sector. What disturbs me about the recent changes is I guess they're now trying to fine tune universities a bit more, you know, discriminate against some subjects in favour of others, all in the name of, you know, jobs in the, as if the main role or the only role of universities is vocational training. So uh, the, um, you know, and they're going to try and rely on what they think are price signals, what they've called price signals to achieve this outcome. So I know that our panel, which is an excellent panel, will have views, very strong views about some of this and some of the discriminatory effects uh, and perhaps the ex extent to which that won't achieve the government's objectives as, as designed. So I'll begin with asking Andrew Lee uh, to uh, kick it off. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, John. Dara Nanawal, Yongu, Nalamanyan, Dunimanyan. Nanawal Wari, Nalamanyan. Lin Jinyan. I call it to a meeting for Nanawal, land to the Nanawal people tonight and pay respect to elders past and present. It's terrific to be joining so many uh, luminaries to talk about higher education. Uh, as a, uh, the, a former economics professor and somebody who's stayed in close touch with uh, ANU since I entered federal parliament a decade ago, this is an issue that's very close to my heart. Uh, Australia needs more people attending university. Uh, we know if we look at uh, evidence from around the world, uh, that one of the main sources of productivity growth is increasing education. Uh, a review that's just out from Harry Petrinos looks at returns to education in primary, secondary and tertiary levels and finds strikingly that the returns to education now seem to be highest per year uh, for tertiary studies. When you have uh, increased automation, uh, that uh, increasingly crowds out jobs that are focused on routine activities. Uh, meaning that it's abstract thinking that is most likely to survive uh, a technology revolution. Mm -hmm. Universities are at their, at their best when they're teaching those abstract thinking skills. And we know right now is exactly the time to be boosting places at university. Uh, people are expecting a doubling in demand for places in some institutions uh, as a result of the simple fact that students understand the biggest cost to university is the foregone earnings. That is, at a time at which you're unable to get out a job in the outside labour market, is the best time to be studying. Now, we saw this in the last recession, in which we had the school completion rate uh, almost double uh, in the early 1990s recession. The counterpart to that now, a generation on, is that we should expect to see more people attending university. 
and we should make those places available. It's good for them and it's good for the nation because education has positive spillovers. Unfortunately, what we've got from this package is a package that sees students pay more and universities receive less per student. The average student will pay 7% more under this package. They will more than double the social work students, the psychology students, the history students. We'll see students undertaking a four-year degree in disciplines of the, those disciplines paying $58,000. Uh, that is more than, more, more than in uh, some much higher paying occupation. Uh, and uh, on a per student basis, uh, university funding will fall. And this is a smart way of going about it. Uh, when my party was last in office, we expanded university places by 190,000 and put the focus on uh, traditionally disadvantaged groups. Students who'd be the first in their family to attend university, Indigenous, Indigenous students. Uh, we look to expand university and to expand the productivity benefits that come from that. So these measures are, are doubly short-sighted in hitting the humanities so far, and so, so hard. One reason they're short-sighted, of course, uh, is that the humanities provide us with much needed wisdom uh, in a world increasingly driven by anger and short-termism. Uh, we do need uh, more people thinking long, thinking deep, understanding disciplines like uh, political science, philosophy, economics and languages. We need people better able to engage with the world. Can anyone really argue that given where the global situation is at right now, we don't need more China experts? <clears throat> Can anyone argue we don't need more critical thinkers? But the other reason is that even viewed from the narrow perspective of wages, uh, the government's got it wrong. Because their modelling is based on short-term wages, wages when you're in your 20s. And if you look at the work of David Deming and others, uh, there is quite a different story uh, when you look at, uh, uh, at, at social studies compared to hard sciences, uh, when people are later in their career. Uh, those abstract thinking skills and broad skills come into their own later in the career. And actually over a lifetime, uh, it looks as though those, those degrees, social sciences and humanities, may pay off at least as well as the sciences. We're cutting back on critical areas such as child protection and mental health, where we know we need more experts. The burden is disproportionately borne by students from regional areas, which is why many national party MPs, such as Andrew Green, uh, Andrew G, have uh, uh, spoken out. They'll be dispropor disproportionately felt by women. The burden will be disproportionately felt by Indigenous Australians, judging from the subject areas those, stu those students cover. Uh, so it is a package which is not right for the times, a times at which we need to be expanding university places putting aside the culture wars and welcoming more students to university. Look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, Gemma? <clears throat> yes, thank you, John. Uh, and like Andrew, I'd also like to acknowledge that even if we're meeting virtually, most of us are doing so on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. As a humanities scholar, when I heard about these cuts, firstly, I was concerned, but then I was also confused because these changes draw an arbitrary line down the middle of the university and they send quite a disturbing message by doing so. Most students actually study a combination of disciplines and the most interesting work happens at the intersection of different fields. So isolating the sciences from the humanities and then siloing disciplines within the humanities themselves is not only old fashioned, it's actually impossible. The University of Tasmania described this really well by calling it a false dichotomy. So for example, in my case, my field is French studies, meaning I teach French language, which has been deemed a priority area. But my research is on French cinema, and I also teach film, which is an area that is conversely being disincentivized by these changes. So according to this logic, from one angle, my students are being deemed, quote, job ready and from the other, they're not. And yet the skills that my students gain from both of these areas are crucial and mutually informing. And from an academic's perspective, the cultural knowledge that I have from my film work directly informs the quality of my language teaching and vice versa. 
But these changes effectively divide colleges, schools, and even people down the middle. And by people, I mean both staff and students in a way that doesn't make sense either in theory or in practice. Despite this, as a languages staff member, I could choose to see these changes as a boon to my field because languages are being positioned as an important priority and rightly so. But behind these changes, I feel there is a dangerous ideology that devalues the humanities in general and all of the skills and opportunities that they offer students. And why history and philosophy fall into this category while English and languages do not is, is frankly quite baffling to me. Uh, but the most important takeaway for me is that there's major potential for damage to be done to the reputation of these vital areas in the eyes of Australian society because the government is effectively sending this message to young people that the humanities are not worth studying. And this isn't going to stop young people from studying the humanities, they always will, but it is going to penalize them financially for doing so. And this adds another issue to the mix when we consider the fact that the majority of art students are women. And ultimately this is really concerning because the humanities don't just produce job ready graduates, which they do, they also help to form an engaged and resilient society in which we value skills like critical thinking, media literacy and cultural competence. So I see these changes as having the potential to really damage the public image of the humanities, despite the fact that students who study them become in fact highly employable and highly competent graduates. Thanks very much, Gemma. I think Josh is next. By agreement. Thanks, John, and uh, good evening to everyone. I'd also like to recognize that we're meeting on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Well, Gemma used words like confusion and baffling, and I certainly share those uh, adjectives and that noun as well. I think a lot of people who've looked at these changes do. Look, I don't want to say too much. The main point I want to make is that it's always essential to invest in the humanities. You know, the crucial questions that our society is facing on communication with other countries, questions around mental health, presidential elections, engagement with other cultures. These are all aspects which graduates in the humanities are uniquely primed to be able to answer. I mean, questions like, can we trust our leaders to believe what they're saying is true? And if so, how? How can we best communicate with people who are different from us or who don't share our view of the world? What history should, be, should we be teaching in schools? We know these are bad times for universities and you know, during a pandemic, it's an extraordinarily strange time to be uh, proposing these changes. Very little time for consultation. My heart goes out to students in year 12 who've been working away all year with their hearts set on doing languages, philosophy, classics, whatever. I remember that was certainly uh, the case for me. And to be given a price signal from the government that it's gonna cost you more, it just seems madness. We know that people will have a lot of jobs into the future. So what better way to prepare for a career requiring a versatile set of skills than doing a degree that asked you to have a diverse set of skills in the first place? You'd think the humanities would be one of the disciplines, one of the areas that the government should be funding more. I mean, even the commercial world is demanding soft skills. We don't know what the labor market will look like and how many jobs people will have. So people need to have a broad based skill set. You know, subjects like languages, French, Italian, Spanish, Russian, German, you know, these are linguistics, language study are all about learning about other cultures, not to mention indigenous languages and indigenous cultures, how other peoples think, people end up working in all sorts of places around the world. And so it's crucial to have an informed view of where others are coming from. Uh, this was certainly my experience, you know, a desire, a passion to want to know about other peoples, other cultures outside of Australia and within Australia as well. These are all subjects that speak to who we are, where we come from, where we're going. And so, you know, whether the price of a course or a unit will go up by a couple of hundred dollars, a couple of thousand, whatever it is, is was certainly not a deterrent in my case to be able to to, to, or to want to study Italian, my, my passion, my professional interests. You know, I often think of Einstein's quote, imagination is more important than knowledge. Well, the humanities are the very stuff of imagination and knowledge. So we need to ask some serious questions about what kind of country we want to be. Thank you. 
Well, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, now, uh, Bruce Chapman, the father of HEX. Uh, be interested in your comments on the economic impact, Bruce, and whether these price signals can work in that environment. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, too, acknowledge that we're meeting on uh, the land of which the original inhabitants were the Ngunnawal people. I want to talk about whether or not these radical price changes, and they are radical, will change student choice. And some people think about the price uh, in, I think, a, a not helpful way. And the simplest and least helpful way to think about the price change is to note that for humanities now, the price for a three-year degree has gone up by about $20,000. And if you think, oh my God, $20,000, where am I going to find that? I better change what I'm doing with my life. Then you're not getting the conceptual basis of HEX prices. So let me try and explain it. The HEX, 90% of people will be paying a HEX price in the future. And they'll be paying it uh, only when and if they earn over about $47,000 per annum. And what this means is that for someone who's like 18 years old uh, next year, thinking about doing humanities, the true price effect is not the $20,000. They don't have to find $20,000 extra. And what's going to happen is that in the way that this should be understood is that for four years, nothing much will happen in terms of payment because they'll be studying three or four years. Then it will take about another 10 years uh, until they exhaust the current level of the humanities price obligation, which means that they'll start to pay this additional price uh, at about the age of 32, at about 4% to 5% of their income. This is a very small amount of money in the lifetime, even if we don't do what economists call discounting. But let me explain what discounting is. Things in the future financially are much less important than they are in the present. And so you have economists use a concept called a discount rate, which means that you reduce the impost of some so-called price, uh, a certain amount cumulative per year. And Gurav Kemka and I have from the College of Business of Economics have just done the modeling on what this means for humanities graduates. What is the extra $20,000 mean if you start to repay those additional three or four years of debt in about 13 years time? And with normal discount rates, the $20,000 is reduced to about in present, what economists call present value terms, to about $6,000. But that's $6,000 over your lifetime. And moreover, it's spread out over a, 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 a period which could be four or five years. We've come to the conclusion that at reasonable discount rates, the, the impost in terms of the additional cost for humanities is about the price now to an 18-year-old of about a, a cup of coffee a week. Now, this, it might mean a lot to you to have a cup of coffee per week, but when you think about what this means in terms of what you really care about, and this goes well beyond the financing issues. The, and Josh, Josh just gave a beautiful illustration from his own passion, what he called his passion and his concerns, what he cares about. So for this small amount of money, which comes down to a present value, a cup of coffee per week, do you really, if you've always wanted to study Italian or English literature or philosophy, say, oh, my, I can't afford that. I think what I'd really like to do is, is a STEM degree. I want to be a chartered accountant. Or I don't want to be a vet after all. I'd really like to be an engineer. And the, re the, the thing is that we're different and we're different in terms of skills and comparative advantage and passion and interests. And those life-defining aspects of who we are as humans will override hex debts starting to be repaid in about 12 years time um, and in protected ways. So if you don't have the money, by the way, you won't be paying anyway. So this is a price effect which is going to be profoundly muted and I would be very surprised if you can see anything in the data. Maybe you could in the short run, but not eventually. 
But let's ask the question, well, that's all very fine for Bruce Chapman, who's spent his entire life doing and thinking about nothing except help, except hex help. Uh, he might get it and he might use fancy lingo like present value and discounting and insurance. Do people actually who don't care about those things or don't want to understand them act consistently with them? Well, the only thing you can do in social science and public policy with a question like that is look at the data. And we actually have a substantial amount of data now. HEX was introduced with almost um, no uh, planning involved for the students. Uh, the price we increased by 25% across the board. Enrolments actually went up, and they went up because the government knew that it had more money for places. We've had other changes across discipline. In 1997, the Howard government radically changed the relative prices uh, for three tiers. It used to be a uniform charge. No effect is the overall conclusion from what we can uh, draw from that. The most important data, I think, are not, not from Australia, they're from the UK. In the United Kingdom, in 2011, the Tory government trebled the price for going to UK universities, which, and their funding arrangements are just like ours. Their system is an income contingent loan. It looks just like HEX. So this is what happened. In 2011, the price went from £3,000 per full-time student year to £9,000 per full-time student year. So if you think that the 113% increase for humanities is kind of really big and kind of surprising and even shocking, have a bit of a look at what happened to the UK. That's a 300% increase. What actually happened was incredibly instructive with respect to the role of prices with income contingent student loans. Applications went down by about 10%, for the year after. Enrolments actually went up. And enrolments over this period actually went up by, by for people from relatively poor backgrounds because the government, the, the rich kids were already there. So the price responses were, I best I think the most accurate word was, as far as we can tell, pretty much zero. I would be very surprised if we see anything going on here in terms of behavioral choices. But there's another issue here which is that's what's going on in my view for the student and their choices. But the issues for the university and what they choose to provide is a complementary and critical part of this whole debate. And I pass over now to talk about that to uh, Andrew Norton. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruce. Andrew. <clears throat> Thank you, Bruce. So there's really there's two sides to this that we're looking at. How will the students uh, alter their behaviour in response to different student contributions. And I agree with Bruce that the answer to that is probably not very much. But the universities are in a different situation. Uh, they don't have anything like a help loan. They have to pay their bills each and every year. And as we all know, universities are in a very serious financial crisis. And so they are going to be very attuned to uh, the price they get for each student place and the costs of delivering each student place. Now this actually created an opportunity for the government because the universities I think would have been quite open to price signals to try and move enrolments, perhaps in the direction of the, the job ready graduates uh, position. And at the margins, there are always applicants who missed out each year, so they could have taken more of those. But instead, the government decided to do something completely different. And that was that rather than change the total funding rate that universities get, that's the student contribution plus the Commonwealth contribution, a tuition subsidy. Instead, what they did was use the results of a study of university costs, which they came from Deloitte Access Economics. And <coughs> decided to make all the funding rates more similar to the average costs uh, as determined by Deloitte. Now, this has led to some very surprising results. So, for example, humanities, uh, universities are now going to get more money for each humanities student than they used to, about $2,500 more a year. So there's actually an incentive for the university to take more humanities students. Arts faculties as a whole won't be better off. Social science has been hit very badly. Communications, which is also often taught in arts, has been hit very badly. But for humanities themselves, this is a positive for the university. They get more money. 
But for a whole lot of the so-called uh, priority fields, the job ready fields, uh, allied health, nursing, engineering, science, agriculture, medicine, mathematics, education, psychology, from the university's point of view, uh, even though there's a positive signal to the student from a lower student contribution, there's a negative signal to uh, the university because they get less money for each of those students than they do under the current system. And so this makes the, the package very hard to predict in its consequences because in so many fields, uh, the incentive being given to the student is quite different to the incentive being given to the university. I suspect in the end, there won't be a radical change uh, in the distribution between fields, just because universities will be conservative about it. But certainly there is no incentive to increase uh, the number of students, no financial incentive to increase the number of students in most of the fields the government is targeting as a priority under its scheme. And so I think one of the problems here is that, as I've sort of said, you know, even within its own terms, this package is not going to achieve its desired results, or we have to have serious doubts about whether it can. And therefore, I think quite aside for any of the particular issues surrounding humanities, it's simply not going to work. And therefore, I think uh, the government or the Senate should prevent this legislation going through. So thanks, John. Well, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I was going to ask you how the, the positive and negative incentives actually balance out, but I think you said you don't know. It's just, right. you don't expect much net change. Yeah. Um, I guess to begin, we should allow each of you to see if there are any comments on each other before we go to more general questions. Um, is there anyone who wants to comment on the comments of the others or a question to one of the others of anything they've said? I'm happy just to open it up, John. Yeah, because I think what you've done is a pretty good job to question the, mo the, the genuine motivation of the government in doing this at all and um, whether it really, really will have the sort of job ready effects, let's assume, that they, that they, that they have assumed. And I guess you all, all agree that it won't. Is that right? Agreed, it won't. I think so, and I think uh, you know numerous people and uh, in numerous places have spoken about the perverse incentives that these uh, packages or that these changes are, are proposing, and uh, it's very difficult to predict exactly what kind of outcome uh, we'll see from these. Uh, so, I mean, it's hard to know, you know how to respond in a certain sense to to a package that's that won't have the intended effect, as Andrew was saying before. I guess you can't rule out the possibility of overall a, a perverse result, given their objectives. I mean, in the context of COVID and the recovery, the strategy that we're looking for from the government, does this make much of a contribution to that? No, I think another of the problems is that this average, uh, by definition, some universities have costs above the average. Mm. And the, access, the Deloitte Access Economics analysis showed that regional universities in particular have costs above average. And I think that's due to the relatively weak economies of scale on small regional campuses and possibly the, the more disadvantaged student cohorts. So the government's trying to help regional students and regional universities through some special funds. But the reality is that the underlying funding model will make life much, much more difficult for, for regional universities than it already is. So again, another important objective that is not really matched by the, the actual policy detail. And if you go back to the Bradley Review of Higher Education, which suggested that something like 15 of the then 38 universities were financially non-viable, uh, a number of those would have been key regional universities, um, they're, they're going to compound that problem, if anything like that. Yeah, so the regionals are always vulnerable and this will just make it worse. And of course, you know, we're having this international student crisis at the same time. And so really universities are being hit with two chaotic forces simultaneously and how the two will interact is another, another important issue. Yes, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. And uh, the first one's from Pamela Collette. What can we do to overturn the proposed increase in the university fee for humanities? What actions can we undertake to increase funding for universities generally? 
plenty of room to move in there. I'll have a go. Um, I just from a political standpoint, it's all about uh, increasing the uh, the costs on the government of going ahead with this. Uh, I think the uh, the approach that they're taking at the moment is that people are focused on other issues during the pandemic, uh, and that they're hoping they're going to be able to just let this slide through. Uh, so making noise, contacting your local local representatives, uh, writing to the minister, making absolutely clear that uh, this is uh, an issue that uh, the government will see a significant fight on. Other comments? So I don't think focus on the humanities price in particular, because I think it's the conceptual flaws are much, much bigger than just the, the effects on the humanities. And therefore, it's a, it's a broader argument of which this is just one aspect. Yeah, I might say something about the second part of that question, uh, which is, for a very long time, those of us who work in universities, and particularly if you're interested in the financing side, have been aware that the system has basically needed international students to survive and to prosper and it has survived and has prospered uh, but the subsidies that are coming from domestic students are not sufficient to cover research i think we're all aware of that and that without the international student market health and growth things were kind of okay but now this extraordinary event has happened which has actually made absolutely clear the fragility of the financial situation of the Australian public university system because of the implications for uh, revenue that come from this extraordinarily large cut in revenue from international students. I know that ANU, for example, has uh, lost just this year 200 and over $200 million. That's a, that's a huge change. And now for the first time, We've kind of, we kind of see the problem writ large. We were all aware of the subsidy issues before and the cross subsidies coming from international students, but we've never seen it so starkly. And so this is, it's not just a crisis, it is a challenge and an opportunity, but I think the debate now will, should be and will likely be quite different than what it has been on the back of the 30 years growth of international student funding. Yeah, as with the... Um COVID's impact on aged care and on health, for example, generally, you're starting to see the crack in the system that were hidden, be, hidden before. The same is happening, I think, in terms of higher education. We have another question from Cameron Bishop. Putting aside the economics, I worry that the government wants to be a moral guide and may generate a cultural stigma against degrees deemed unworthy. If the proposed changes are viewed as virtue, virtue signalling, what role do you think government has in determining worthwhile academic pursuits for an individual? <coughs> Related question. If I could, Jen, um, yeah. I think this is going to be a really interesting um, thing to watch play out. Uh, because on the one hand, um, as I was saying before, like there's this this very dangerous message that the government is sending about the the the, the value of the humanities and and this virtue signaling, I think, is, is a good way of, of, of phrasing it, um, has the potential to be really powerful, but it depends on how this message is taken up by students. So obviously, um, current students who've already chosen to study humanities are particularly biased and, and have made that decision for themselves. But I've been speaking with my students this week, and many of them are reacting, I'm sure, in the opposite way than the government would would hope in that they are being further inspired and further um, uh, pushed to, or further, um, uh, yeah, inspired to continue studying the humanities because we have a culture of resistance um, at the moment in particular that is, is really healthy. And so that I think will, will actually push a lot of students who may have been on the fence about studying humanities to actually enroll. Yeah, that's a good point. Other comments on that question? Um, Tim Pittman's got a question. He agrees with Bruce that it won't significantly change student behaviour. He also agrees with Andrew that it won't overall change institutional enrolment profiles. Am I right, therefore, he says, that if the legislation is passed, universities will end up teaching more students for the same amount of funding? 
and this is this will uh, likely affect the, t the quality of teaching question mark we'll have a go at that so really one of the key elements of the package which has kind of been lost in the debate about the student contributions is that it is designed to reduce the average subsidy per student so that universities do in fact have to deliver more student places effectively for every million dollars that the government gives them. And so that is a key objective of the package. The question is, will this affect teaching quality? Well, to some degree, I think this cut has already happened because universities are what we called over enrolled. That is, they are taking more students than they are officially funded for. And so, I'm not expecting necessarily a massive change to teaching quality in the short term. But if they do what I think some of them might do, uh, and that is for these new 14,500 fields, which is basically humanities, communications, law and business, they may decide to take additional students on the 14,500 student contribution alone and have increased enrolments in those fields. and. Even though 14,500 is the vast bulk of their plausible funding for those fields, you know, this will on average drive down the total resources per student and may have some effect on the, the quality of teaching over the, the medium term. Joshua, do you think it will impact on the quality of teaching? Uh, in the long run, like Andrew is saying, I mean, if we're being asked to do more with less, then obviously things have to you know, change. But uh, I mean, it, at the end of the day, we have to ask where the money is going to come from. Somebody had sent in a question in earlier about philanthropy and whether there's a role for philanthropy to provide further funds for universities. We don't have the tradition like in the US or other places of having those kind of donations. And so you know, traditionally we have had to rely on uh, international students to prop up the system in a way. And, as Bruce was saying before, you know, there's no secrets. We are all aware of the kind of cross subsidization that goes on. Uh, and so um, it's just another, you know, and it kind of goes back to the question that was being asked before as well about virtue signaling. I mean, that, you know, every time the government seems or wants to try to uh, fiddle around the edges with the kind of prices, it never seems to have the desired effect or work out very well. So uh, I can only agree with my fellow panelists on this issue. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rob O'Connor's getting the feeling that the current broader crisis could transform universities' relationships with state governments. He's looking for thoughts on that. And then he's clarified that question to say, is there a sense that state governments and philanthropic courses might step in to make up the gap? Is this perhaps what the government expects and hopes will happen? <clears throat> Ambitious thought. I'll have a go again. So yeah. the basic answer is no. So for a long time, universities were a joint state and Commonwealth responsibility. Uh, but the reality of the tax arrangements in Australia is that the states did not have the financial capacity to run universities. And so McGough Whitlam offered to take them over in 1973. They were very enthusiastic about that. And since then, They've done the occasional, we'll pay for this building or this project, but shown no willingness to go further than that. And I, in a very challenging fiscal time, I can't imagine that will change. Andrew, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, Andrew. John, uh, one uh, thing to remember at the moment is just the uh, enormous uh, ends to which the government has gone to ensure that universities didn't get access to the JobKeeper package. So they changed the legislation not once, not twice, but three times to ensure that universities didn't get the wage subsidy support that other sectors got. Uh, that's the reason why we've seen thousands of jobs go. It's the reason why Universities Australia say there'd be 21,000 more jobs that could go across the sector. Uh, so it's, it really is crunch time for universities. Uh, unlike Andrew, I don't see uh, a... Uh, White, white knight riding over the horizon from philanthropy or state governments. I think universities are uh, a squarely a responsibility of the federal government. Uh, and there is a national interest in ensuring right now that every kid with the smarts to go to university has a place there waiting for them. Uh, that's good for them. I mean, why would you be paying unemployment benefits when you could be paying the cost of supporting somebody to attend university 
knowing that they would be so much more productive through the course of their lives, uh, knowing that their uh, boost not only to their own earnings, but to the, the earnings of their co-workers was going to be better. Uh, knowing that they were going to be healthier and less likely to be a, a drain on the health system, less likely to be on welfare, less likely to commit crimes, all those sorts of positive spillovers. And that's before we get to the basic spiritual questions as to the, the health of our national conversation, the quality of our public discourse uh, being so much better uh, when we have people trained in, in the humanities and social sciences. So do you think it would be possible in this country to change tax structure and other, other elements to encourage philanthropic support for higher education? I mean, the US is a classic example of you know, some very rich universities, very large endowments. Uh, we don't have that attitude or capacity in this country. But do you think it's possible to go that way? The university, the US, of course, spends less public dollars than anywhere else and uh, uh, is top of the charts when it comes to philanthropy. If you take the US out, then philanthropy in Australia uh, puts us about in the, the middle of the advanced country pack. Uh, so I'm not sure you would use as your benchmark a country where uh, you've got massive inequality and incredibly low public spending uh, as the, the drivers of philanthropy. Uh, I do think there's just a, a, a national interest in this uh, because there's a, there's a public benefit. Uh, where we see uh, public, public uh, benefits, where we see positive spillovers, uh, it makes natural economic sense that the government would uh, step in to provide assistance. Uh, that's what we've historically done. Uh, we saw a, a massive expansion of university places uh, in the period from 2007 to 2013. We saw a 25% increase in the size of the number of uh, students attending university. And there's no reason why we couldn't see another surge now. As you well know, John, this, this isn't ideological. Uh, Menzies was a, a strong backer of a healthy university sector. So we don't have to have the culture wars in this space. No, that's right. It's one of those areas where in the end, I mean, national interest in bipartisanship can actually carry quite a lot of weight. Yeah. But it's hard to, uh, it's pretty, to me, it seems such a, a simplistic view of the world to say that we'll try and, as I said, fine tune this, uh, the provision of degrees such that we will, favour job ready <laughs> disciplines and dis discriminate against the rest uh, without doing any any hard evidence behind any of that. I mean, it's uh, and, um, you know, I guess that uh, there's also the change. I think Madeline Smith's got a question here on the changes in TN's reform package. One of the elements is the, the removal of hex from students who fail more than half their courses. Uh, I would say that this is a particular change of, of sorry, particular interest and an immediate concern to current and future university students. So I'm interested to hear thoughts on this change from an academic or university perspective. I might have a first go at this one because I've written a bit about this one. So I'd have to say there's been a bit of a misapprehension around elements of this. So mm -hmm. if you fail half or more your subjects mm -hmm. uh, in your first year or in over a year, you're already in serious trouble. And so the university the way out, aren't you? <laughs> will be giving you a show cause as to why you should be able to stay. What is going to be different about this is that at the moment, the university can take a wide range of factors into consideration. Say, well, you, know, you had some disruption in first year, but we're satisfied that's gone and you will succeed on your second attempt. Whereas under the government's rules, there are very narrow things that can be considered, such as you're, you're, you're sick, or a member of your family was sick, and it has to be something that was outside your control. What about COVID? The kind of organisational reasons why first year might fail are, strictly speaking, within their control. And therefore, it's the loss of discretion that is the problem. I suspect most students who failed more than half will voluntarily or forcibly leave anyway, but there is this group who probably should be given a second chance uh, who won't be able to give, get it in their current course. Though strangely in the legislation, you can switch to another course or university. It's just the course you originally enrolled in that you'll lose your funding for. The timing of it's rather odd though, isn't it? Because if there's an external factor that's impacted on a lot of these students and their lifestyles, it's been COVID. 
I was just going to respond with that as well. Sorry, Andrew, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Um, but yeah. those are really important um, factors that, that you raised, Andrew. Um, but it's a very problematic year and time to be introducing this new rule, considering the fact that we've just moved due to COVID-19 to entirely or almost entirely online teaching. And so many of the support structures that were in place for students um, in the standard system before have just been we just haven't been capable of, of providing them in the same way. So there have been and there will be students who aren't passing courses that under normal circumstances would have. So it's a particularly troubling um, change to bring in at this moment. Mm. Can I just agree with, with Gemma's point as well? I mean, you know, going to university and especially in your first year can be a very difficult and troubling time for lots of students particularly if you're first in family, indigenous or a rural student like I was, there can be a whole, a whole crop of issues that come up. You know, people acting as if mental health is something in your direct control is madness. And you know, it can take a semester or two, uh, if not more, to kind of find your footing, find a group of friends, find support, really kind of feel at home, so to speak, at a university before you uh, start doing well and start really dedicating yourself, you know, to your studies. And so it's not a simple process to kind of just slip straight in and think that everybody's going to get, you know, HDs and pass with flying colours every single, you know, failing a unit is, is or failing a course is not the end of the world, but it seems like that's exactly what this change being proposed, you know, is, is making people think, and that's scary, actually. It's particularly odd, too, when the government is now struggling with the reality that... Uh, the COVID experience is having very significant consequences on youth mental illness. And, um, you know, they're struggling to understand the magnitude of that problem and they're trying to pour some money into it. But at the same time, they're contributing to it. Uh, this is what I say. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who's got a question for Bruce. While HEX does not have any upfront costs with the increase in fees are, are going to be a potential long-term impact on postgraduate study as there is a $100,000 limit on the HEX debt and over half of that would now be taken up by an arts degree with honours. Bruce? I, I'm not on top of the detail of the uh, limits on HEX for people who study postgraduate, but it's, it's clearly uh, highly undesirable to have caps that are reached, which could easily happen with a few years of not doing too well and failing or deferring and then kind of finding yourself as a student, doing a combined degree, doing an honours degree, maybe a master's and then um, beyond that. So I think it's a very, it would be very unfortunate if people uh, stop because of hex limits on progressing through postgraduate. My understanding is that that's unlikely to be true, but I defer to Andrew on this, Andrew Norton. Yes, so there is a limit of just over $100,000 in help debt that you can have in any given time, but it has been changed from a lifetime limit to you can repay and bring yourself back down below the limit. So that would give you more borrowing capacity. But I think this is a, this is a good point that's being raised here because it means that not only do you pay more uh, as an undergraduate, but you have less scope for borrowing for a postgraduate degree later on. So it's kind of a double whammy. Mm. Others, other comments? Okay, uh, James Lindsay says, I studied mathematics and physics, yet never used those degrees in my employment. Why does the government think that people who study STEM subjects will work in STEM areas? Can I say something? Given, about, the, given the mobility in the, in, in, among younger people in terms of career choices. So I just say something about this, John. He, yep. The idea that there are jobs out there for people who study particular courses or disciplines is, is not the way to understand the labour market. The people who study philosophy do not become philosophers. People who study languages do not become language teachers. Uh, you'll have some skills which are clearly job specific. I mean, you don't want you you don't want your accountant taking your teeth out, do you? You don't you don't want your dentist um, doing doing your tax return, uh, and you probably don't want um, a nurse defending you in a court of law. But but with those very specific examples, the the, the, the most important point about learning 
at a tertiary level is it teaches you people the capacity to learn. And even within fairly structured disciplines like engineering uh, or law, uh, people will be acquiring most of these skills on the job. And so I think it's kind of a, a weird way to think about the labour market as if there are slots and people to fill the slots with particular arrangements, which we call disciplines. Le learning to learn is fundamental. And the other point I'd make is that just like the questioner, people change all the time. They move all over the place, particularly when they're relatively young, trying to find what suits them and actually say, well, I did, I did mathematics, but I'm actually not using any oil or equations in my job here in the public service. Yes, but you might be learning how to learn things and how to structure things and how to analyze things in particular ways, which might be quite propitious and apparently unrelated to simple categorizations of what skills and learning are all about. Okay, thank you. I think, Andrew, you're about to go, Andrew Lee. So I just say thank you. I am. Thank You're you very welcome. much for having me a part you. of the conversation. Really enjoyed it. And if people want to touch base directly, I'm uh, not hard to find on the internet. Thanks for your contribution, Andrew, as usual. Excellent. Thanks for the conversation, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the inherent assumptions of a lot of the government employment policies is just that they assume the jobs will be there. And you see this with JobKeeper. You know, when we stop JobKeeper, people will just get back to their... <laughs> to the jobs they had before. Here they're assuming that if you study a subject, the jobs will be there for that subject. I think it's, uh, you know, again, it's not really evidence-based policy that's being made here. And I, 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 have, I struggle to understand some of the political motivations for some of these changes. Uh, I've got a question about um, philanthropy again. Isn't philanthropy just rich people deciding what they deem worthy of money? Whereas public money can be persuaded through the political process and more people uh, can have a say in spending it. I wonder if I could say something about philanthropy in the US context. Yeah. So uh, the question came up a while ago, uh, would we ever do uh, have arrangements that look a little bit like the US? And I think probably not when we understand what a lot of philanthropy is with respect to, for example, the Ivy League. So with the Ivy League universities and Harvard and Princeton, um, those arrangements, while they appear to be philanthropic, the, the, many of the contributions come from alumni and the alumni are really basically putting an insurance system to make sure that their children will get a slot. So they're implicit contracts, which kind of look like people are just generous and want to give lots of money because they care about education but uh, there is self-interest in a lot of that, which I don't think will be replicated in the Australian context, because compared to the US, we have fairly homogeneous institutions. I mean, there are important differences within Australia, but they're nothing like the US. So I think we need an Australian specific debate. I think we could look more, more to countries a little bit like ours, New Zealand or England in particular, and we'll find the opportunities much less potentially advantageous than they do if we look at the US. In lots of ways, the US is a very unusual and I think very poor model to think about higher education. They've got some of the worst student loan problems in the world. Uh, and let me just point out one of them, which is relevant to COVID. If you graduate as a college loan debtor in the US right now, you've, you're in trouble because you'll be obliged to repay your college loan, that there'll probably be forgiveness going on, irrespective of your income. And that's true of most student loan systems, uh, which is not true of HECS and it's not true of the UK or the New Zealand systems. So it might be tempting to look at the US as some kind of leader. I think they kind of illustrate to us in many ways what we don't want to do. Uh, to continue on from that, Bruce, I, uh, I think that's very important. Um, and there is a tendency to view ph ph philanthropy as this potential um, sort of saviour in this situation. But not only do US students come out with an enormous amount of debt, um, particularly in comparison to countries like uh, Australia, but there are also major uh, labour issues with faculty in these private universities that rely on um, enormous uh, philanthropic donations. Um, but also to, to sort of elaborate on that, that nepotistic dimension of um, 
philanthropy for the sake of, of providing places for people's children, um, I just wanted to note how very much that would and does affect uh, first in family students, Indigenous students, all students who don't have that, that um, existing privilege uh, that affords them that access to university education. So I think there are very many risks and, and um, issues that need to be considered if we're, if we're considering the potential philanthropic model. You see gaps in the US philanthropic model when you see people being charged for paying bribes to get their kids into top class universities, wealthy people. Exactly. Uh, you know, um, not to make too strong a point on it. Uh, in the past, Chris Anderson, in the past, it has been thought that there was a research or base funding component to the Commonwealth grant scheme. It seems that these amendments quite explicitly position the Commonwealth grant scheme as a, as a teaching only grant would the, likely, would the panelists like to comment on the significance of this change and what consequences there are for universities, particularly the research intensive universities? I can deal with this one. Andrew, yeah. So up until 2004, this fund was explicitly for both teaching and research. Uh, since then, the legislation has been silent on the subject. Uh, but nevertheless, it's been clear that there probably is about a billion dollars worth of research funding being essentially paid via a student driven program as a legacy of the way it used to operate. And probably about half of that, or maybe more than half of that will disappear as a result of these new funding rates. So combined with the decline in international students, I think this is going to accelerate the collapse of the teaching research academic employment model that that was premised on there being essentially parallel growth in teaching and research activity and that just can't happen when both the this source of research funding and the much bigger international source are disappearing at the same time and so this is going to be one of the the consequences of this whole crisis COVID plus the tea in package that will fundamentally change the nature of academic work in Australia. A related question really from Natasha Abrams is, will these reforms result in, and among other changes, I think, result in a less educated Australia? What are the long-term implications? So, one of the problems here I is- I have generalise, I know, but- uh, yeah. One of the objectives of this package is to allow the number of places to increase in the mid 2020s when the so-called Costello baby boom will reach university age. And so one of the reasons for cutting the average funding rate is basically so you can generate more places on basically each million dollars. But there's no guarantee that funding will ever eventuate, even though the lower funding rates will be there. And so even though the number of student places probably won't go down, there will be a much larger school leaver cohort. And so it is possible the percentage of people going to university after school, which is currently about 41%, uh, will go down unless that growth actually happens by 2024, 2025. Yeah. I guess something that, that bothers, bothers me is to what extent does this sort of thinking behind this sort of change and a number of others reflect a view that, look, universities are basically there for vocational training purposes. They're not there for the broader the benefits and dimensions of a, you know, a, a liberal arts or broader based education. And uh, that's making some pretty significant judgments, I think, about the sort of country Australia is or that they would like to see it. Um, to, with the, if you see a collection of these sort of decisions, have you got any views on that? Well, uh, that's the rhetoric and clearly a sort of policy people like myself when asking where did this come from mm. you ask what does this look like what it looks like is vocational education policy where there's a long history of pulling funding levers designed to encourage uh, students and education providers to do this rather than that and there's even provisions like the stuff about failing that we were talking about before, there's a whole lot of so-called student protection measures, which are basically cut and paste from the vocational system. 
designed to deal with completely different problems, often around this vet fee help scandal of a few years ago where you know, dodgy providers were enrolling students who didn't even know they were enrolled and totally corrupt behaviour. There's no evidence for any of this in higher ed, yet higher ed is getting the same kind of very bureaucratic uh, mm. rules to try and prevent things that aren't happening anyway and are very unlikely to happen. Yeah, their attitudes to vocational training do bounce around. I remember the first Abbott budget cut $2 billion out of vocational training as a designated area, separate, of course, from universities. Uh, on the assumption when asked about that, they said, look, uh, the states will pick it up. Yeah, and states this have is no area capacity shared responsibility. So I guess anyone who thinks it would be good to have higher ed with shared responsibility should look at flock ed and see how that's gone. Yeah, have a look at, at health, yeah. Um, okay, Jin Heng Tan says, how does the future of humanities find its place and contribution in a world where there is a lot less emphasis, talk and encouragement to go into useful, valuable, in demand and lucrative fields like health and STEM. The importance of research and innovation and the impact of technological advancement on our lives and in the workplace, e.g. Uh, IT skills. I would say that th those are precisely the adjectives that you would use to describe humanities, useful, valuable, in demand and, and you're providing lucrative jobs. Uh, you know, we, the, the kind of big questions that peoples and that societies are asking themselves are the questions that humanities graduates uh, are primed to answer. You know, and, and so they're becoming more and more relevant, not, not less relevant in a sense. Uh, the kind of questions that were being raised even the other day by the deputy mission from the, the Chinese embassy, questions about how we can communicate with people in terms of COVID, uh, they, you know, it's true that there is this, in, you know, this acronym STEM. At one point, people were talking about changing it to STEAM to include arts, but then you've got every discipline in them, so there's not much point having an acronym. But uh, you know, yeah, these are the, yeah, and so these are the kind of issues that humanities graduates can can respond to. Basically, mm. I mean, you know, it's not to this divide is just unhealthy to think that we've got kind of technical skills and and you know people who are who are answering bigger questions about how we should behave how we should live what's important to us uh, and so you know i can't see that it's true you know we don't we want them alongside obviously we do need technical skills we do need accountants we need lawyers but we also need people to reflect and provide policy and provide answers about what the important things are you know, to humanities are asking questions. I think that one of the greatest gifts that we can give our students is to prod them to keep asking, go deeper into the questions that uh, of the disciplines that we teach and that we research, to ask them, to get them to go deeper into those questions rather than giving them, you know, a course reader and saying, here's the, read the textbook, the answers are in there. I mean, that, that is not teaching, that's, that's nothing. No, it does, it does erode the significance of imagination and, and the capacity to think outside the square and beyond the textbook, which I think is a very important problem for Australia because uh, increasingly we'd like to think of ourselves as a clever country <laughs> and none of that's terribly clever. Um, Patrick has given a question about, I guess, the politics of this. <laughs> you should try and have a go at understanding it. Is there any clear indication that the wider public actually understand that this reform will reduce the funding of universities received per student? Also, is there evidence that the wider public support a move towards a system that relies more on philanthropy rather than government subsidised tertiary education? I don't think so. I think that the proposed changes in the way that universities are financed and, and the kind of change, that's just so complex mm. that, that uh, you know, they're just so difficult to understand. And, uh, and so you know, the, whether the wider public, I haven't seen any evidence that there has been any kind of discussion like that in the in broader society. I mean, we need, uh, you know, seriously experienced and professional economists like Andrew to come on and, and have him explain them even to us about what the kind of changes are. Uh, and I think, you know, like Gemma was saying before, it's kind of relapsed into this rhetoric and to kind of the virtue signaling, 
the kind of messages that it sends about universities and what the, the changes mean in a kind of rhetorical sense rather than about any practical applications they're going to have. So, yeah, I can't see that, uh, that, that, there's, that the public is engaging with these you know, issues on a, on a finance kind of level. The worrying feature, if you look at the way politics is made in this country, and as Disraeli said, I think it's like sausages, you don't really want to know how it's made. But a lot of this comes from a view that, uh, a prejudice really, that's based on sort of um, polling, uh, whether it's uh, quantitative or qualitative polling. And they'll test these expressions with some focus group, you know, and they'll say something like, do you think it's a good idea that we skew the funding of university, the funding of universities to the subjects where the jobs are going to be. Tick that box, you know, these sort of questions. And that, um, it doesn't get much more sophisticated than that because that results in an announcement. When the announcement's made, we don't worry about the consequences of that announcement. We just move on tomorrow because politics is so short term to another issue in another location. Right? So a large part of what you see in the words you picked up before the words they've used to describe the move they're making, yet you use them to defend humanities. Uh, so, um, you know, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a, a sad commentary of where we've ended up, but uh, when it comes to evidence-based policy, it doesn't carry a lot of weight. It also brings us back to this um, old-fashioned assumption that if you do a degree in physics, then you'll become uh, a physics uh, a physician, or if you do a, a degree in chemistry, then you'll become a chemist. I mean, I was talking to a student of mine, a former student last week, who did a Bachelor of Arts with a minor in French and honours in anthropology, and she's now working for the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science on um, future thinking for climate change issues. And her boss came up to her last week and said, you just have a different way of thinking. Yeah, we're so lucky that we have you. So the assumption that humanities students aren't going into STEM and STEM adjacent fields is, is a really narrow minded assumption. I remember my econometrics teacher who was the leading econometrician in the United States. Um, his background was trained as physics, but he'd worked basically on the Manhattan Project. I don't think you take too much for granted. Um, Erica Neep has got a question. Are we heading towards a contraction in the university sector with teaching only universities and consolidated research institutes? Interesting interpretation. Probably not. Um, but we've had, you know, the system does promote research concentration because research funding is paid based on historical research performance. And so if you're good in the past, you get more for the future. On the other hand, uh, I guess one of the issues with taking some money out of the, the student driven funding is harder for the smaller universities to maintain their research activity. And that will be another problem for the, for the government. But I think it's unlikely we'll move away from this teaching research model. Any comments, Bruce, on that? I think he's just stuck down for a second. Oh, has he? I can't, I'm behind my... Oh, well, there he is. I'm oh, sorry, what's the question? Um, the question was really, will these measures sort of lead to a tr contraction in, in the university sector with teaching only universities and consolidated research institutes? My view about these suggested changes uh, is that they'll lead to close to nothing except higher charges for people in some areas and lower charges for people in others. I can't see any fundamental institutional change coming from this. Uh, I think that the behaviour of students will be hard to pick up in the data. I think that the universities won't respond particularly differently. Nothing big is happening here in terms of the overall structure and, his, and future prospects for the institutions. And that's what makes it kind of difficult for me to understand the rationale for this. And I, I've never really understood politics, but I think at the moment, this is the best example of me understanding politics the least. Uh, and I, don't, I just don't get it. I'd really like to know what you think, John. No, I, look, I, was, I, I think you're out, but the politics of this is very difficult to understand. I think it is based on short term sort of focus group polling, testing slogans and lines rather than policies, trying to tap an emotional position. 
rather than uh, actually look to solve a problem. And there's a lot of ironies in this sector. I mean, they recognise the university sector is dependent heavily on foreign students, for example. The motivation for a lot of foreign students to come to Australia is the standing of our universities. You know, most of the global uh, assessments of standing, they're based on research output. And yet the government cuts the hell out of research. Uh, so you know, it's, it's a self-defeating process uh, that gets lost. The politics get lost at various stages in there. Okay, um, Madeline, what effects might this package have upon the attractiveness of a career in teaching at a university level? And what might those effects look like in the long term? If no one else wants to touch it. Uh, clearly, uh, with thousands of academic jobs being lost across the sector, we're going to lose probably a generation of academics who might have started their careers in the next few years. And so, and that's going to have, you know, flow on effects back to people who are currently doing PhDs or thinking about doing PhDs, because they'll be very uncertain about their prospects. Another issue is that you know, if I'm right about the long-term logic of the academic employment market, which is we need more teaching only academics, in the fields where most of the curriculum is dictated by professional admission requirements for the professions, I think the logic is to take more people who've got professional experience in the relevant occupation over people who've got PhDs or, or research uh, track records. And so in some ways it's, the question is about teaching, but it's the danger is more about the research side and whether they're going to be research careers in the future. Because the reality is Australian demographics are changing in ways that mean there is going to be demand for teaching uh, in coming years. But it's the research side that's in deepest trouble and the fact that we're going to have this missing cohort of people who would have started their careers in the early 2020s. Mm. Yeah, okay. Gemma, did you want to comment? Um, uh, I was just thinking about the fact that the increasing casualization of this entire industry, especially around teaching positions, has been a major issue for years, but has been completely um, intensified by the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, because the first staff to lose their jobs were our, were our sessional staff, who are our teaching only staff. Uh, and that's a, an enormous percentage of, of the teachers uh, at all universities in Australia. Um, especially PhDs and PhD students, but also very long-term um, staff members who had established careers in, in this field who, who immediately lost their jobs because of the budget um, cuts post COVID. So um, I think that this was already an incredibly precarious uh, field to be going into. And this is just the latest of another a long line of factors that will that will really cause people to to question whether to go on to a PhD, which is a, a really concerning and sad um, situation that we find ourselves in. Yeah. Okay, we've got a very general question, uh, anonymous. If I had lost access to tertiary studies because of the courses I have failed, I wouldn't have developed so many skills I use every day in my employment: critical thinking, communications, research, IT, and so on. And, and been even more socially isolated at a time when my mental health was at its worst. University just isn't just about graduation and employment. How are these aspects of education measured in policy making? Short answer is they're not. Not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of the sort of the later Grattan Institute reports I co-authored with my colleagues was actually on students who had not finished their course. And a fair number of them were quite positive about it, including a lot who actually said they would still do it uh, despite knowing they wouldn't finish it because they got a lot of benefits from it. On the other hand, uh, we also had a lot of concerns about people who are just continuing and continue to fail badly and whether the system is really doing enough to either support them or encourage them to leave and stop getting this extra help debt when it's very unlikely they're going to get benefits from further study and further fails. So there's an awkward balance here uh, and I think you know, my view is it's not that students who are failing should be allowed to automatically try again just that it's to be a careful evaluation of their individual circumstances rather than using an inflexible bureaucratic rule to decide whether they stay or go. 
I think the question it makes a really great point though about how university isn't just about graduation and employment. Again, uh, the, you know, the rhetoric is kind of turning universities into uh, instruments of, of you know, policy making and of trying to create a particular market for a particular type of student, a particular type of outcome. But they're actually important places where lots of different things happen, not least of all responding to the COVID you know, pandemic. And if it's particularly for undergraduate students, you know, they're places where you meet people, where you engage, places for growth. So it's important to keep these things in mind as well. That's right. I expressed the concern in my opening remarks that the government seems to think it can fine tune university education. There's a question here, an anonymous question. Do these changes in funding affect the opportunities? Oh no, sorry. Um, the government always says that universities are autonomous institutions. Is this the first step in the government encroaching on the day-to-day -day management of universities? Mm. Probably not in terms of actual day-to-day -day interventions, but clearly it's designed to steer their behaviour more closely to what the government wants. So one other aspect we haven't discussed at all is that part of the money they're taking out of the Commonwealth Grant Scheme will be given back to universities via two new funds, one for equity and another for uh, industry engagement. And so again, it's trying to use those two funds to not tell universities exactly how to go about their day-to-day -day business, but to tell them what goals they should be trying to achieve. Yeah. I mean, if they could skew the system in a particular direction more than they've done, I think they would. If they thought there was a political support for doing so, and that would come from some focus group telling them that it was worth the effort. But um, it's not evidence-based again. Um, Joshua, you were about to speak, so I'm sorry. No, I think Bruce was, but... Oh, Bruce was. I think, so Bruce is behind my Q&A page. <laughs> ah, thanks, John. I mean, governments have... Because it's a, it's a public sector system, the government have always had control over prices and that they have intervened in different ways. Originally, it was a uniform price, which meant huge cross-subsidies. When the changes happened in 1997, uh, there were three tiers and the prices were highest for uh, lawyers, doctors, vet science, dentistry and lowest for arts and, and um, business or whatever. So governments have been able to express opinions, if you like, about what they think is an equitable or just price. I think that they set those prices in 1997, in part because of an expectation that lawyers would do well in the labour market, and in part because there was sympathy for nurses, because their incomes were relatively low. What is different about this is that this is the first time that I'm aware of where the government has actually signalled uh, a belief that there can be not just price changes that have behavioural effects, but ones that are good for the economy. And that is, that is a, that's quite a leap. We've never seen, well, I don't think we've seen that before, a judgment about what is good for economic performance in the post COVID world. And I think that the base, if we have a basic theme in this panel is, where's the, the evidence for this proposition? There are all, all kinds of views out there which I think become popular without any necessarily, necessarily any important empirical base. One is STEM. We, I pick up newspapers or look at computers all the time where people say, well, STEM's a good thing. And I think, well, where's the data for that? And when you look at STEM graduates and how well they do in the labour market uh, or the queues for STEM jobs or uh, the queues for STEM places at universities, they're not unusual. There, there's been religion in that as well. So if anything is coming out of this, which uh, I think needs to be promoted, is the, importance, is the importance of the evidence, the importance of the data, of which we've found very little today. I, I think focus groups are the work of the devil, really. I can see all kinds of weird stuff coming out of focus groups. They're very small in number. They're self-selected. The questions are designed by people with particular views about things. So, my God, I think we'd be so much better off not thinking about uh, or putting all this energy into the relative prices between disciplines and getting a bit more propitious data on what these things actually mean in, in the higher education labour market. 
So I have the distinction in politics of paying zero attention to any focus group surveys. That I've <laughs> <laughs> Probably didn't help me win the election, but I mean, it's a, it's, it, they, even when they get a clear message from a focus group, like you can't, if you can't govern yourselves, you can't govern the country, which, <laughs> which is what Hawke won the 1990 election on against Peacock. The Liberal Party's response to that polling was Andrew is the answer, so didn't dwell on it for a while. Begs the question as to what is the question. Uh, look, all up then, I guess if we bring these questions to a head, um, if we, well, two things, I guess. One, if we assume that they are based on some sort of assessment of the political significance of the issue, is there electoral support for a decline in the significance of the university sector? Um, particularly in the context of the job market, which is, seems to be their particular focus. I guess my view is that historically higher ed has never really been a major political issue and it probably won't become one due to this package. And I think Joshua said it's, it's extremely confusing to even understand what's happening, uh, let alone form a, a view that would change your vote. However, I, if we don't get the growth in student places uh, by the mid 2020s, then I think there will be some politics. So once a whole lot of people in Melbourne and Sydney find that, which are sort of growth areas, find that they, their kids aren't getting into university because there aren't enough places, then I think, and a lot of these, a lot of this growth is in those outer suburban seats, which are often the, the swing seats in elections. So if we don't get some movement, it, it may turn into something of a political issue, but I think the reality is there are usually bigger things going on which means that higher ed is not in the top five or 10 issues that are dominating politics. And interesting to mention is the link between what the products, of uni the number of the products that universities produce and the actual employment demands for those. I remember a couple of years ago, I spoke at a Law Reform Commission um, event. And um, so I did, I'd had a look at the numbers as to how many solicitors were likely to graduate in the following year relative to the number of jobs for solicitors. And it was 60,000 graduates and 12,000 jobs. You know, on one side, you're going to flood it with a lot. And that's happened with the finance sector in the, in the 80s, carrying into the early 90s. And then suddenly the finance sector got cut back after the recession in the early 90s to a fraction of the employment possibilities that were there before. And um, that mi mixing of the demand and supply, the understanding of the link between demand and supply doesn't get recognised in government either. Look, a final question is, I guess, to ask you, each of you, what do you think it will be the long-term consequences of these sort of changes in the context of the other changes you know about attitudes to research and to higher education? Gemma. I think we've, we've um, pretty much established that the, the long-term economic um, consequences are probably going to be negligible. I think what we have to, in, in terms of, um, uh, of these funding um, changes, but I think what we have to pay real attention to is the long-term ideological changes that, that could, um, the, the impact that could um, follow on from, from the kind of message that, that we're receiving about the value of, of humanities and the, and the, the value of STEM and, and uh, the kind of um, symbolic messaging that we're receiving from the government, I think is, is the real risk here and something that, that we have the power to, to to really pay attention to and be critical of. So it's just not an economic question, is it? It has significant social consequences. And, yeah. and um, I think some basic attitudes towards the value of education broadly defined, rather than just vocationally defined. Uh, Joshua. Look, I, I just see these changes as another instance of the government trying to overstep its mark in a way. And you know, one of the previous questioners mentioned the day-to-day -day management of universities. I don't think it will infect you know, the day-to-day -day management of universities, but uh, they, it's just another instance where they shouldn't be getting involved in the first place. It's not to say that, you know, obviously, you know, universities have to work with governments. Well, you know, a lot of funding comes from government, but I can't help but not draw parallels with the ABC, you know, also an independent kind of organization Majority of money comes from majority of funding comes from government, where again there we've seen you know in the press in recent days and over the past few years now a constant kind of trajectory of people, even at the ministerial level, kind of uh, again overstepping in ways that are just not palatable to the general public, uh, 
and to the people within those organizations. So, so you know, name, not, if you're a professor whose name happens to be Alberici, you haven't got much of a future. Well, that's right. I mean, you're speaking of Italian studies. It's a, you know, it's a terrible uh, situation. But I mean, um, so yeah, I think there's a long term, you know, the long term zero. But in the short term, the damage, you know, from the go is considerable. Uh, Andrew? So I think it's probably 50-50 whether this will get through the Senate or not. Yeah. Um, but I kind of think it's going to cause some, if it does get through, it's going to cause some chaos for a number of years. But I suspect that it doesn't really have any strong foundation of support in the community or even within the government. And therefore, probably large elements of it would be reversed within a few years if it does actually get through. Bruce? Well, in terms of real change, I don't think there'll there will be any in two years time this will be kind of a, a blip of a headline if it doesn't particularly if it doesn't go through the a blip of a headline or something that happened in COVID in, in August in COVID-19 but but you know a grain of sand on the beach of complexity and difficulty and uh, whether or not somebody is going to be convinced that the, their view of humanities versus STEM versus whatever is going to be radically changed by this announcement i think it's extremely unlikely but you know it's not that's not my bag of tricks but i reckon in two years time this will be gone in all kinds of ways i recall the uneasy look and demeanor of the minister tian when he was announcing this policy admitting that he'd been a humanities graduate himself uh, which uh, was a moment of awkwardness in terms of dealing with the policy. And I guess there might be one other base political motivation that we haven't talked about, simply one of distraction. Uh, distract from uh, the emerging problems in the national cabinet and the difficulty in handling COVID. The timing could have been no more significant than that. Anyway, I thank you all, uh, Gemma, um, Joshua, Andrew, Bruce, and the other Andrew, who's now gone your contribution tonight. I think it was a very useful discussion. I hope the audience found it a useful discussion. But thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, John. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks, A and U. Stephanie? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. That was a really great discussion. Um, and it was really great to see the audience participating and all of the questions that you asked it was really interesting. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to give a really big thank you to our speakers and hosts for volunteering their time this evening. We really appreciate it. And I found it really informative and engaging and I'm sure that other people did as well. Um, so there will be a recording of this webinar. It will be made available on the ANU's uh, YouTube channel in the next few days if you wanted to revisit anything. And shortly you'll receive a post-event survey as well. It's really short and we really value the feedback to help us keep approving these kind of events. Um, so please take a couple of minutes to fill it in. We'll be really grateful. Um, that was everything from me and Thank you again to our host and speakers. It was a really great session. Thank you. And thanks very much to ANU Learning and to you, Stephanie, for the work you've done to get this organised. We all appreciate it. Thanks very much and good night. No worries. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. What is ANU Learning Communities? It is a place where people gather for stimulating debates. To separate the art from the artist is for some to actually protect the art that we love. A community to explore the best of local art. It is an ongoing conversation on the world. Neoliberalism has meant that governments have stayed out of the way of all sorts of things. And a place to discover things you never knew. And it has also presented an opportunity for more repression in the region. A push for a better future. It's a place to make connections with the best people. A place that acknowledges the past. Build a house and I'm here to help and to maintain the culture. And a place that looks to the future. The implications are that Indonesia will need to borrow, but it's expensive for Indonesia to borrow overseas. It is a place of magic and bubble teas. 
and flowers. And endless energy. So, chest nice and tall, shoulders back. A place of diversity. A community to make friends. A place to look at the stars. History, culture, sustainability, creative arts, global challenges. Find it here. Welcome to the ANU Learning Communities.